I'm Michelle Ackley. My parents both grew up on council estates and as a family, we understand the difference social housing can make to people's lives. But across the UK, there's a chronic shortage of council and housing association homes. I know so many friends and so many people that just literally don't have anywhere to live. Adding to the crisis, some tenants are abusing the system, holding onto properties that they no longer need, or even worse, unlawfully subletting them and coining in a small fortune. Subletting social housing is wrong. It's wrong, it's illegal, and it's wrong. So every day we'll be with the housing investigators as they crack down on those rogue tenants. Can go Reclaim properties. Anybody? And give them to families in genuine need. Oh, oh don't, because you'll start me off again. This is Council House Crackdown. Our reporter, property expert Luke Doonan, also grew up on a council estate. And for the last six months, he's been working alongside dedicated housing investigators who will stop at nothing to track down every single tenant who's abusing the system. Today, we're with investigators as a grandmother appears in court, charged with illegally subletting her council flat in a tenancy fraud spanning more than eight years. The message is quite clear to her. She was very upset, she was crying, her family were upset. You know, just don't sublet your properties. A man suspected of subletting his flat was exposed when he gave an interview in a local paper revealing he was the landlord of a pub. I think what changed his mind is when we told him that social housing fraud is a criminal offence. Yeah. And the mystery of the family who disappeared and left their flat abandoned for nearly two years. This is not quite expected. Speechless, actually. Absolutely speechless. It's estimated that 98,000 social housing properties in England alone are being illegally sublet. And with a desperate shortage of housing in many areas, it costs councils an average of £18,000 a year for every family housed in temporary accommodation. All of which means tenancy fraud costs the public purse around £1.8 billion pounds a year. The London Borough of Greenwich, with its rich royal and maritime traditions, a growing population and nearly 35,000 social housing properties. Our first case is about a 60-year-old grandmother who's at the centre of a tenancy fraud spanning more than eight years and is now, finally, about to face justice. This is Jacqueline Willoughby. She's been living here at this council flat for nearly 30 years. Or at least that's what everyone thought. In reality, she moved out in 2007 and has been cheating the system ever since. Today, Mrs Willoughby is due to appear in court and we're with the housing officers as their investigation reaches its conclusion. Greenwich Council investigator Karen Evans is about to brief her manager, Nigel Brown, about the case. Jacqueline Willoughby, she's 60 years of age. She brought her children up there. The tenancy she had for about 30 years, so it was their, you know, their family home, if you like. Then in 2007, she met someone, got remarried, and moved out of her three bedroom council flat. She meets and marries a gentleman who lives around the corner, basically. She effectively leaves the property. But instead of handing her keys back, she let a family member stay there instead. And, making things worse, investigators believe she made a deliberate attempt to cover up her actions. I believe that she's deprived the council of the use of that property since, therefore since August of 2007. She left the property and she continued to pay all of the bills herself, all the rent payments and everything. Any communication with the local authority was via her, so she, she disguised the fact that she had left the property. It was a deliberate act. 
tenants are obliged to inform the council or housing association when they move out of their social housing property. Failure to do so is a breach of their tenancy agreement. No one can pass a social housing tenancy on to another person, not even a family member. However, you can apply to take over a tenancy and this will be considered on the basis of whether the property meets your needs. In 2014, seven years after Miss Willoughby moved out of the flat, the other relative also decided to leave, but the family still didn't give the property back to the council. Instead of giving the property back, it was sublet to other people for, for profit. It was about double the rent that we were charging that was being paid by the sub-tenants. What was the weekly rent on that property? The rent was £127 a week. And what's she been charging it in later years? Monthly, it's a thousand, nearly £1,100. Thanks to new legislation, investigators were able to look into Miss Willoughby's bank records and see exactly how much money was going into her account. Some was even marked rent and bills. Over several months, Thousands of pounds had gone into her account. Over the years, it amounted to approximately £13,000. So really for the last seven years or so, yeah. she's been subletting out tenancy and we've had to house other people because of the fact she's deprived of her own property. She's taken that property and kept it for herself, decided who she wants to live in there, instead of returning it to us. <laughs> By holding onto a flat she wasn't entitled to, Mrs Willoughby was stopping someone else from having a home of their own. Not only that, but the council had to pay a much higher rate to house someone in temporary accommodation. As a result, somebody on our housing um, waiting list has, has had to be housed in alternative accommodation at a far greater cost each week, so yeah. The amount of money involved from, from the time we say she left the property is something in the region of £102,000 in losses. But that wasn't all. After six years of misusing her property, the tenant was about to make her biggest mistake. In 2013, she applied to buy the family flat under the Right to Buy scheme, and in doing so, tried to fraudulently claim a huge discount on the market value of her home. Coming up, we find out what happens when Mrs. Willoughby is confronted with her criminal activity in court. So what has Mrs. Willoughby been charged with? Four counts of fraud. I can understand some people subletting because they've gone and moved away for six weeks and want to come back and can't afford to keep it over that period of time. But to hear that they're subletting just for money, I don't know. They should be they're definitely kicked out and have to repay back that money. It shouldn't be seen as an income generator for someone privately that can afford it. They should move off the system and there's plenty of other ways that they could probably make their money. Take it off them and then what you call let the tax man crawl up their backside looking through their accounts and get the money back on. Because at the end of the day, as a taxpayer, you and I have been robbed. Since the government first recognised the need for social housing after the First World War, council homes have been built in a huge variety of shapes, sizes and locations. Here in the village of Bear Green in Surrey, some of these bungalows are part of the local housing association's stock. In our next case, housing officers suspected that one of their tenants, a 63-year-old man, was renting this bungalow out and living elsewhere. The facts only came to light when he couldn't resist giving an interview to a local newspaper. Luke's gone to meet fraud manager Steve Baker from Mole Valley Council. It was a tip-off from neighbours that first alerted Steve that all was not well. The Housing Association received a tip-off from, from another tenant okay. um, and they passed that information on to us, right. which is what they do on all of their yeah. um, suspicious social housing fraud cases now. We received information that our tenant in the property wasn't actually living there and they believed he was subletting to another young couple. Steve's first step was to make an unannounced visit at the property. We're just coming into the village now where the property is located. 
This is quite stunning, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure there are so many people that wouldn't even dream that you'd have social housing in this location. It's a real proper country village, isn't it? Yeah. And we're right next to a station as well. As you can see, it's a lovely area. A property in this area for the council to build mm -hmm. would probably cost about two hundred thousand mm -hmm. pounds, um, and we have people who are waiting to be housed in these sort of properties. Of course, of course yeah. It's quite idyllic, isn't it? And I yeah. mean, I know it's a one-bedroom bungalow, but you've got your own front garden. It looks like it's got a back garden. It's, it's quite stunning, really. When housing officers first visited the bungalow, there was no one in. So they left the car and asking their tenant to contact them. Then they started to carry out some basic checks using council records. The important thing for us was to try and find out where he was living, if indeed he was living somewhere else. So initially we did a check of a lot of our internal records. We checked our council tax, electoral registration, housing benefits. And we also did some credit checks on the property. At first, everything seemed in order. The tenant was the only person on the electoral register and had been paying council tax at the bungalow for the past seven years. But financial checks revealed six of the names had had links to the house, including a bank current account, credit card and phone company connected to a young couple who seemed to have been there until two months previously. Everything was still showing him as registered at the address and the credit checks showed a few people as um, potentially being there, but nothing that really could be followed up. To some degree, we'd hit a bit of a brick wall on this one and weren't able to go any further. But investigators have a variety of tools available to them to make checks on suspected housing cheats. And in this case, it was a simple internet search that gave the team their breakthrough. Steve discovered the tenant's name online in a news story about a flood in Dorking Town Centre. I thought, we'll just do a Google check on his name and see if anything comes up. And we actually came up with a news story. The news story was in relation to a flood in a, um, in a street in Mull Valley, in the Dorking area. Um, and our man was quoted as being the landlord of a local pub. There was nothing to stop the tenant having a job in a pub. But being named as the landlord did potentially link their tenant to that address. And that was enough of a reason for Steve to investigate whether in fact he was also living there. This is a news article that appeared on, on the Google site. Landlord of the nearby pub says it's really dangerous during the day. People notice it and can avoid it. But at night time you could just go right into it and hurt yourself. He's talking about some kind of uh, flood damage to a road, I, I believe, but clearly his name's there. Yes, we had no idea he was working as well, um, and obviously we had him uh, registered as being a tenant of another address. Armed with this extra information, Steve examined council records, and investigating who paid the council tax at the pub was about to give them a lead. What I did is I spoke to our council tax section who deal with the business rates as well as the council tax registers. I asked them what they had at the pub and who they had registered. They didn't have our man registered there. However, the pub did have a flat oh. above the pub. Okay. Um, and that was registered in the name of a woman. She was listed as the manager of the pub who divided her time between the pub's flat and her own home in Dorking. With evidence growing that their tenant was linked to the pub's address, the team used new legislation to access his financial history, and Steve found he'd applied for loans using the woman's home address. Once we knew the property that he may be linked to, we did some further credit checks on the address. Yeah. And what they actually showed was that our man was registered for two loans at the lady's address. If he'd been living at the address he says he was living at, why is he taking out finance at a different address? Yeah. The financial links to his girlfriend's address gave investigators enough evidence to justify a further visit to the tenant's bungalow to see if they could get an explanation. But when they arrived, they were greeted by a man who said he was a friend of the tenant. When we knocked on the door, the door was answered by someone we weren't expecting. Right. It was another male, aged about 45 to 50, said he was just staying over a few days while the tenant was helping him out. But the man did confirm that the tenant's girlfriend was the manager of the pub in Dorking, 
Steve and the team left a message asking for the tenant to get in touch. And it wasn't long before they heard from him. We left a card for our tenant, and within a couple of days, the tenant actually phoned us back, right. and queried what was going on, and arranged to come down to the office to see us. So he contacted you pretty quickly. That's all right. Um, so we organised an interview with him. When the tenant came into the council offices, he was shown the financial evidence linking him to the woman at the pub and her house in Dorking. The tenant denied living at either address and subletting his bungalow over a number of years. First of all, we told him what our suspicions were. We told him we didn't think he was living there and he's illegally subletting the property. Mm -hmm. He, of course, denied this. We then started to show him some of the evidence that we had. But he still carried on denying that he was doing anything wrong. I think what changed his mind is when we told him that social housing fraud is a criminal offence. Yeah. While the tenant went away to consider his options, the housing association's priority was to get the house back into their possession. With more than 400 people on the housing waiting list in the Mole Valley area, the home was desperately needed. And after the interview with investigators, the tenant made a swift decision. Within a couple of hours, he phoned us back and told us he had in fact moved in with her um, and gave up the tenancy. Wow, so a really good result for you. That's right. It's even better news for one Mole Valley family who'd been waiting for a social housing property. Within a month of the neighbours' tip-off, they were able to move off the council housing waiting list and start enjoying life in this popular Surrey village. It's a lovely place. Um, and now someone who actually generally needs it is renting that property. I definitely think that subletting is something we should be cracked down upon. It's, it is taking, uh, taking advantage of a system. Uh, the housing has been provided for the people who need it. If they have somewhere else to live, they don't need it. There was someone on my block who had a property and had another property in Hackney and was renting it out to various people. Um, Milan from all over coming in and uh, they're, you know, paying high rent for the flats. But eventually they got caught. People that, you know, exploit that system in that way, it's, uh, I guess, a shameful abuse of that system. The government's right to buy scheme has been running since 1980. Under the scheme, you have the right to apply to buy your council house and in some cases housing association home if you've been resident for three years or more. In 2015, the available discounts were increased to a maximum of £77,900 outside London and £103,900 in London. We're back in Greenwich, where today, Grandmother Jacqueline Willoughby will be sentenced at Woolwich Crown Court for first subletting her council flat and then fraudulently applying to buy it. What was the weekly rent on her property? The rent was £127 a week. And what's she been charging it in the late years? Though? Monthly, it's £1,000, nearly £1,100. Six years after she left her council flat, Without informing the council, Mrs Willoughby made an application under the government's right to buy scheme. With a discount of £100,000, the three-bedroom council flat would cost her just £65,000. She then, in 2013, actually put in a right to buy application. The right to buy application shows a specific question. Is the property the tenant's only or principal home? And as you can see, it's been ticked yes there. The council asked for more information from Mrs Willoughby, and when she didn't provide it, they cancelled the application. But the following year, she tried again. This time, the discount was calculated at £102,700, putting the cost of buying her flat at £72,300. The 2013 application um, they didn't proceed with it. They later made a declaration again to the council that they'd been honest in their declarations and made a f an, another actual application, completed another application form, again answering that question in 2014, that one was, 
saying that it was her main and only principal home. But in Greenwich, the council investigates all right to buy applications as a matter of course, and council officers paid a visit to the flat to check that she was still living there. Instead of finding Mrs Willoughby at what she said was her only address, there was a couple living there. When they went to the property, they found the subtenants there who were quite frank about the situation. They were paying £1,100 to who they believed to be the landlord of the property. The flat was being rented for double the amount being paid to the council. What's more, the occupiers had no idea it was a council-owned flat. So the investigating team called Mrs Willoughby in for an interview. We had to interview her and she answered no comments to all of the inter uh, interview questions. She gave a written statement to say that she'd just moved out in the spring of 2014. If a recent application for a right to buy has succeeded, how much would she have got from, from us? How much of a discount? About £103,000 she would have received in discount. With all their evidence in place, Mrs Willoughby was charged with four counts of fraud one for subletting the flat, and three in relation to the right to buy applications. So what has Miss Willoughby been charged with? Four counts of fraud. The first count being her not using it as her own in principal home, as well as the subletting in breach of section three of the Fraud Act. Two, three and four all relate to the right to buy matters because there were two applications and a further declaration made. Has Miss Willoughby pleaded to any of these offences? In the previous um, court hearing she pleaded guilty to all four. Today it's time for Karen and Nigel to see the final result of the investigation. They're going along to Woolwich Crown Court where Mrs Willoughby is appearing to be sentenced. After hearing mitigation the judge handed down his sentence. Mrs Willoughby was sentenced to nine months imprisonment, suspended for two years and ordered to do 150 hours of community service. And as Mrs Willoughby and the family leave court after the case, both council officers hope the sentence will deter others from trying to profit from social housing. Well, the result today is the lady got to nine months imprisonment, suspended for two years. So basically, um, you took into account her age and other factors. The message is quite clear to her. She was very upset, she was crying, her family were upset. You know, just don't sublet your properties. She's now got to work 150 hours in the community, unpaid. So at least she's given something back. She's now got to pay some of our legal costs, which is good. I think they awarded £750. We're now going to be pursuing her for our financial losses of over £102,000. Um, as a result of her depriving us of our property that we could have given to somebody who was actually in need of a property. The Greenwich Council flat at the centre of the fraud has now been re-let to a new tenant. You will get caught eventually. Sooner, I'm not saying today or tomorrow, but eventually you will get caught and then well, everything will catch up. The sort of punishments I would think would be significant financial ones. So I'd be reluctant to do prison because it simply costs money. Um, but I suppose in the worst case, prison is an acceptable outcome, but huge financial penalties. I don't know what the current uh, punishment is for misusing the system, but for a start, I'd say not lifetime ban, but banning access from using that system for a considerable amount of time. Empty and abandoned homes can pose a real problem for councils because it can be a time-consuming and costly process to recover them. There's more than 65,000 social housing properties currently unoccupied in England, Wales and Scotland. In the busy market town of Bicester, there's mystery surrounding one flat that used to be lived in by a young mum and her child. Tenancy fraud officers are desperate to get inside because it seems the family have disappeared without trace. The rent's not been paid since last year and the mum and her eight-year-old child haven't been seen or heard of for months. Today, investigator Lee Mariconda is on his way to visit the two-bedroom flat owned by Paradigm Housing Association. He wants to know if they've abandoned the flat or if there's another explanation. 
I've done quite a few visits to this property, all hours of the day, morning, afternoon, evening visits. Um, not been able to get access. So we're actually now gonna go and do a final visit, just to go and see whether or not there's anybody there before we might take any final action. In the last two minutes, I've left calling cards and I've also left a letter asking the tenant to contact us. And unfortunately, I've had no response to, to anything that I've left. And no, nobody's been at home on any of the visits. So it, it comes to the conclusion that they're either ignoring me or there's nobody there. The young mum's rent was being paid by the council through housing benefits. When the rent stopped being paid, Lee stepped in to see what was going on. Housing benefit was in payment, housing benefit suddenly stopped due to a change in their circumstances. And since then there's been no contact from that person, there's been no correspondence to put housing benefit back in place, to make an agreement to pay the rent arrears, uh, been not contacted Paradigm at all in, to, to discuss their tenancy. When a tenant abandons a home and they don't inform the council or housing association, investigators need to establish exactly what's happened. From a personal point of view, I grew up in social housing until about the age of 13. I feel that social housing is there for a good reason, for people that, in my situation, when we couldn't afford to live in private rented or get a mortgage. And that's why I feel passionate why social housing has to be protected. Lee needs to find out whether this flat has been abandoned, but he's also concerned about the family. His inquiries started with the neighbours. I went and spoke to neighbours and all have confirmed that no one lives there. And we rely heavily on neighbours because they're the ones who can see and hear things that we social landlords don't, don't see. With a child in the family, one way to check if they're still in the county is to see if the boy is registered at any school. So Lee's next mission is to get in touch with the education department. One of the investigations that I carried out was contacting the county council's education department to find out whether or not the child was registered with a school in the county. Now, the county council came back to me and confirmed that the child had been attending a school in the county up until a year ago, uh, but no longer attends any schools in, in the area. It just adds more weight to our suspicions that the property is abandoned, and we can use that as evidence if we go to court. It looks like the family might have left the area, but Lee needs to make sure before the Housing Association can take action. So what I'm going to plan on doing when we get to the property is just to a door knock, see whether anybody answers the door, have a look for the, the signs to see whether or not anything's changed since my last visit. Anything that would just indicate there's been some kind of a movement in the property. And he's not taking any chances. Last time he went to the flat, Lee took some extra precautions to make sure he'd know if anyone was coming or going. On the, the last visit, I left some cellar tape in the lock. Now, it sounds bizarre, but if you put cellar tape over the lock, someone's going to have to use that lock to get in. And if the cellar tape is still there, then clearly that lock hasn't been used. I also put the recycling bin on the, the mat in front of the door. So if anyone's been there, then you know, it'll be moved. As Lee arrives, he spots the first telltale signs that nothing's changed since his last visit. The bin's still where he left it four months ago. Recycling box that I left it in the middle of the front door is still there. It's not been moved from the last visit I made. As you can see, the set that I put on the door is still intact there, um, over the lock here, and also on the chop lock at the bottom, which, you know, if it's still intact, shows me that no one's made any attempt to enter this property. I'm 100% sure that the property's abandoned and this center has been on the lock now since for the last four, four months now. There's nothing wrong with giving up a housing association flat, but tenants are obliged to let the landlord know so the property can be given to someone who needs it. Now Lee can start the process to get the property back. I mean, eviction's a big deal. I mean, it's not something we take lightly. That's why we have to carry out all the investigations that we can in order to get the property back. You have to be satisfied that the property is abandoned before you take eviction process. This process could have been avoided if the person that was living here done the simple thing by just giving us back the keys. We could have got this property back a lot quicker. I'm going to go back to the office now and uh, process the court papers. Coming up, 
As the bailiffs move in, the housing association officers are shocked by what's behind the door of the abandoned flat. I must admit, I didn't expect this. Uh, I have to be honest. Shock. I, I think that's on a abandoned council property. That, that's really unfortunate. So it's a real, you know, waste of a, you know, accommodation for people who, who need it. I think if, if, if that's as you know significant and material as you possibly suggest, I think you should put, you know, put policies and procedures and processes you put in place to try to identify those properties and, and then make sure that, that those those properties are put to the appropriate use. Well, if someone's leaving the property and actually just leaving it to you know, to rot, essentially, again, that's just taking a very, very valuable resource from the marketplace, essentially. They've got it, but then they leave it. Do you know what I mean? They, they've got it, and it's a privilege. It ain't, it ain't a right, it's a privilege to have it. Families throughout the UK are desperate for social housing but waiting lists are longest in the capital. In Tower Hamlets in London's East End, there are nearly 20,000 households waiting for a social housing home. Almost 3,000 have been waiting for more than 10 years. And six of those households have been on the waiting list since the 1980s. Investigating and tracking down housing fraudsters puts a strain on the public purse. And when councils are forced to go to court to get a property back, the costs can soar. It can cost local authorities up to £12,000 to evict someone. The tenants of one social housing flat in this tower block moved out and went to live in Ghana, letting her family use the flat. But even when investigators caught up with her, she and her son still refused to give back the keys, forcing the council to go to court and get her evicted. Ford investigator Avril Drummond was called when a man was seen taking belongings out of the ground floor flat. The housing officer emailed me um, to advise that on a visit to the area, um, she had noticed that there was a gentleman clearing out the property. The tenant should have been an elderly lady in her 60s, but the gentleman who was there, he said he was the son of the tenant. When tenants leave their social homes or there's any change in who's living there, they're obliged to let the council know. But in this case, there'd been no communication and the housing officer wanted to know why the man appeared to be clearing the flat. He gave them his details but the rent was still being paid, so we started having a little bit of concern that it might be being sublet or about to be sublet. When he was pressed for more details, the tenant's son wasn't very forthcoming with information. He said he was the tenant's son. He said that she'd been in Ghana for a couple of months, she hadn't been gone for long, and he was just changing the carpet. With the tenant supposedly away in Ghana, Avril's first task was to find out what was in Poplar Harker Housing Association's records about her. First steps were to look back through the tenancy, see who was registered at the property, who the lawful tenant was, who else had been living with, with the tenant. The records showed that the woman tenant had moved into the flat in 1994. The only other tenant registered at the address was her brother, but he'd already moved out. There was another gentleman that was registered as living there. He was the brother of the tenant, um, but we had rehoused him as he had claimed that he was overcrowded living there with his sister. So we decided to go and visit the property then. Avril and the team did their best, but whenever they visited, no one was at home. Within a couple of weeks, I made several attempts to visit the property early morning, during the day, later on in the afternoon. I left calling cards. Nobody contacted me to say, right, well, I'm living here. There was no communication whatsoever. The people best placed to know what's happening at a property are usually the neighbours, and that was the team's next step. I spoke to the neighbour who said they hadn't seen the lawful tenant for years, you know, a long time, and there was another male um, that seemed to come and go, but they didn't believe there was anyone actually living there. It looked like the tenant could have moved out without telling the council and left the flat for the convenience of her family. 
I started running checks on the tenant and anyone else who'd been living at the property. The tenant hadn't been registered there on the electoral roll since 2010, so that's five years. She'd only had one bank account listed at the property and that had also ceased any activities from 2012. So for three years, there didn't look like there'd been any activity from the lawful tenant. Avril wasn't going to leave her property empty for any longer than necessary. She informed the tenant that the flat was going to be taken back by the housing association. Well, the next step for me was to serve notices on property. I tried contacting the alleged son by the phone number that he'd given the housing officer. Avril asked him to come into their offices for an interview. He agreed. The son said he came and went, um, but now he had moved into the property. He couldn't tell me, though, how long his mother had not been there. He believed it was a couple of months, and I told him it was clearly she had not been there for years. He was also surprised he didn't know his uncle had been living there either. So it was clear to me that he hadn't known the full circumstances of the tenancy. I advised him that uh, we were serving notices on the property and the reason why. Avril also wanted to know how long the lawful tenant had been away in Ghana and why. He did say his mother had not been well and I asked him to bring in some kind of like proof that she'd been taken ill abroad. The son couldn't provide any proof, so official notices were sent to the flat as well as to the woman's address in Ghana, informing her that the flat was being reclaimed by the housing association. Then Avril heard from the tenant. I had received a letter from the tenant in Ghana saying that she was away and uh, could her son look after her affairs while she was there. I did write back to her to advise that we had served notices and I enclosed the notices and asked her to seek independent legal advice. I told her we couldn't allow her son to remain in the property. He had no legal claim to the property. Avril asked the tenant to return the flat to the housing association herself, said there'd be no need to take legal action, but she didn't do it. The file was then um, sent through to our solicitors. We applied to court for possession hearing, and we had the initial hearing in January of this year, 2016, and the judge granted us outright possession forthwith of that property. The son would have seen the order for possession. I did contact him as, as well. He said he needed a little bit more time to vacate the property. I gave him an extra week and a half. The keys won't return to us. The family seem in no hurry to give up the flat they're now unlawfully occupying. It's particularly frustrating for Avril as the property is on the ground floor, so it could be being used by someone from the housing list who has difficulty getting around. Avril has since visited the flat a number of times to try and get the keys back. This property is a one bedroom flat. Currently in our borough, we have over eight and a half thousand households on the waiting list requiring a one bedroom house. The court gave us possession of this property uh, a few weeks ago. So I have had to instruct our solicitors to request um, a bailiff warrant from the court which is going to be more time consuming and more costly. So we're just going to have to wait and see now whether he hands the keys back as promised or whether the court vote comes through and we have to wait for the bailiff's warrant, which is something I was trying to avoid if I, if I could. The bailiff's warrant could take six to eight weeks to be processed by the court, but within three months, this flat should be ready to house one more tenant from the waiting list. If they found somewhere else they live and they can afford to pay rent, then they should vacate their own house and give it to somebody who hasn't got anywhere to live. If it's if it's a house that you're you know you're getting from the state and you have enough money to move abroad, it's just it's just not fair. It's about people that are living here right now that need the help right now. Like it's so important that people get housed and are safe and healthy when they need it rather than just like waiting. <laughs> Earlier, housing investigators visited a family flat that seemed to have been abandoned by a mum and her eight-year-old child. 
Lee Mariconda has done all he can to track down the tenant. The county council confirmed that the child had been attending the school in the county up until a year ago, but no longer attends any schools in, in the area. It just adds more weight to our suspicions that the property is abandoned. After his last visit, Lee went to court to get permission to evict the tenant and repossess the property. Today's the day the bailiffs go in to take back the abandoned flat. A locksmith will be on hand because housing associations and councils don't hold keys for their properties. It's frustrating for us because it's a property that we know is sitting there empty and has been sitting there empty for a while and we should never have got to this stage. Um, but this is the last resort and this is the only way that we're going to be getting the property back. And here we are. I'm coming here to meet my colleague Lauren, who's from the rents team and a locksmith. Uh, we're actually going to be carrying out the eviction and we're just also going to be meeting the bailiff here as well. Hi Lee, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, Bailiff's here yet? No, I've spoken to the bailiff, he is on his way. Um, right, but okay. the locksmiths are... Oh, brilliant, we're going to have to talk to him. Yeah, it's good. You had any contact from her at all? Nothing at all. No. Not no. me neither? No. Hi, actually, how are you? Not bad, yourself. No, not bad. Hi, uh, Laura, we met before, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. The bailiff has arrived. It's his job to hand the property back to the landlord, and he's usually employed by the county court. He will escort anyone inside off the premises, but he can't use force. It's up to the housing officers to fill him in on the background. The more he knows, the better, as he'll be the first one through the door of the flat. Is it the upstairs flat? It's the flat, this one here. So that's the top flat in the floor. Basically, we've had no contact from her for several months so now. Neighbours have not seen her. Have neighbours. Neighbours have not seen her. I've put Sanitep over the lock in October, Sanitep's still in the lock. And also we've done some background checks as well with agencies and they've all confirmed that she's not here. The tenant was notified of a date and time for the eviction. That time has arrived. It's one o'clock now, so the eviction can go ahead. The locksmith is getting to work. Once everyone's in, he'll change the locks. It's been a long journey to get to this point, and there's some tension in the air. Everyone's keen to see what's on the other side of the door. There can be various complications because somebody could have barricaded the door and so on. Eventually, we always get in. My role is to just turn up and be the first into the property and then to make sure that there's nobody left in the property. And if there is somebody there, I give them the opportunity to collect the essential things they're going to need and um, I escort them off the property. We don't have no idea what's behind the other side of the door. It could be anything. And we're in. Anybody in? The housing officers were expecting an empty flat, but they're shocked to see it's still full of belongings. I must admit, I didn't expect this. No, well, you don't know what, yeah. I was expecting nothing to be here, to be perfectly honest. Generally, when a property is abandoned, they would just normally just leave. They'll take their personal belongings and stuff like that. It's generally what happens, but this this is not what I expected. This is this is like they've just got out for the day or something, you know? <laughs> speechless, actually. Absolutely speechless. It's as if the family have walked out of their life, leaving absolutely everything behind. It's just like they've just popped out for the day, you know, and they're just going to come home of an evening because literally there's literally there's everything here. You know, there's belongings, there's furniture, there's clothing, there's paperwork. There's all kids' stuff here as well. It's very rare that you you go somewhere and not take anything. And there's an extra bed in there, which yeah. suggests that there's been more people living in the property than yeah. we were yeah. aware of. This is unusual because it does look as if they were left with the intention of coming back. And clearly they haven't. Looking around the flat, it's obvious this family left in a hurry. 
In the bedroom, Lee and Lauren find letters that give them more clues about when the mum and her child disappeared. The letters that are out are dated 2014. The stuff that we can see, I mean, stuff going back to early 2014, so it would indicate that was roughly around the time that person was last here. Yeah, so there's something here from September 2014. I've only been trying to get hold of them since about um, August time. It's very bizarre that there's letters here from 2014. It yeah. kind of suggests that the property's been abandoned a lot earlier than what we thought. Yeah, shock. I have to be honest. The rent was covered by housing benefit through the local council, and it was that that stopped. And then the rent arrears started building. We had no contact from the tenant, which obviously made us take further action and start investigating it further. Lee's getting worried. He's beginning to think there might be more to this story than meets the eye. One concern that we might have now is that we might just have to make some inquiries with the police, see whether or not there is any, any reason to be concerned. I mean, things like this, you've got a box of, like, shells and stuff. I mean, to, to us, it might not seem anything, but that's a sentimental thing. Why have that not been taken with them? Things like kids' glasses, for example. Again, you know, the child's going to need their glasses. You've got a calendar here from January... 2014. 2014, so that's the last... That's when it was last on there, so, again, that could indicate that's when they were last here. So we're talking two years now. This is really concerning as well. There appears to be an outfit ready to go. It's clear the housing investigator's work isn't done yet. They'll have to make every effort to find out where the family's gone. And even though the belongings have been left behind, they can't just be destroyed. By law, the owners must be given 30 days to collect any of their possessions. We have to make every effort that we can to try and get forward an address for them. The police will only give us certain information, so we'd have to obviously ask for information under a under a, a welfare concern, and we can certainly do that. The last inquiries I made that the child had left school in the county in 2014, so where they've gone after that, it, it seems to be a bit of a mystery. While they try to track down the family, an inventory will be made of everything that's been left in the flat. If no one makes a claim on the items within a month, they'll be destroyed. It does hold things up a little bit more. But unfortunately, it's protocol and that's what we have to do. The locksmith's done his job and the housing investigators have done all they can for the moment. Lee's leaving with mixed feelings. But while he tries to solve the mystery of the family's disappearance, at least one more household will soon be able to leave temporary housing and get a home of their own. It's not what we expected today. I mean, it's a bit of a shock, but there's a positive out of that, and that's the fact that we've now got property back, and we'll be giving it to a family pretty soon. I'm intrigued more than anything as to what's going on there, because something clearly is not right, and I'm going to try and find out what's going on. But in the meantime, we're going to obviously do our bit to get the property cleared and, and get it back into, into possession for somebody else. After we filmed, investigators did manage to track down the family, who were found safe and sound in Birmingham. Within three weeks of the eviction date, the flat's new tenant moved in, a man who'd been sleeping rough on the streets for two years. It's down to the determination, dedication and detective work of housing investigators that so many social housing properties are being reclaimed and given to families that really need them.